You're listening to a message presented at Newmarket Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in Newmarket, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at Newmarket Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. Now today's message, I'm sure none of you do this. I'm just sure none of you do this. But the title of today's message is Grumbling. Now I know, I know that you probably don't do that. But there are some people in the world that grumble from time to time. And as we study this whole idea of grumbling, the first thing we learn is, grumbling about God's leader is a dangerous thing to do. Now that's going to sound a little self-seeking coming from me, but it's not coming just from me, it's coming from God's Word. And we're going to see some pretty strong examples of that. Grumbling about God's leader is a dangerous thing to do. If you turn over to Numbers chapter 12 and hold that in readiness, we're going to be looking at that in just a couple minutes. Numbers chapter 12. It'll also be on the screen if you want to look up there. In this chapter, we find that Miriam and Aaron begin to feel that they might be just as qualified to lead Israel as Moses was. Ah, Think about that for a minute. They're starting to toot their own horns. After all, Miriam was Moses' what? And Aaron was? (laughs) Sibling rivalry. Not only is that the case, but we know at least Miriam was older than Moses. Because she's the one that got Pharaoh's daughter to get a mama to breastfeed him when he was pulled out of the Nile and he got uh, Jochebed and Amram to, to foster parent him, so to speak, in order that he could be raised up in his own household. So Miriam's been a part of this since the beginning and she's starting to think, her and Aaron are starting to think, hey, if God can use Moses like this, he could use us. He could use us. As a result, they began to lay the groundwork for a power grab. You know what I'm talking about? Laying the groundwork for a power grab? Man, I've seen it happen over the years. You know how it works. Well, let me kind of give you an example. Here's how it works. Have you noticed how self-seeking Moses is? It's all about him standing there with his stick, holding it up in the air. Have you noticed that it is always Moses' way or the highway? You ever notice that? Have you noticed how every time a decision needs to be made, Moses is right there in the middle of it? Have you ever noticed that? He's always right there in the middle of it. That preacher always wants to get his way. Whoa. Did I say that out loud? I've heard that before over the years. And then I have a a clue in the world that I'm not even doing it. It's a committee someplace or the elders or the deacons or the board. It's, It's crazy, but it happens. Moses always wanted to be right there in the middle of every decision. How about this one? Have you seen that Cushite woman that Moses married? Moses thinks he's better than everybody else. You ever heard that? That preacher thinks he's better than everybody else. That elder thinks he's better than everybody else. That deacon thinks he's better than everybody else. That chairman of the board, he thinks he thinks it's always going to be his way or the highway. Have you ever heard that kind of stuff? Well, that's the kind of stuff that was going on back then. They're laying the groundwork for a power grab, if you will. How about this one? Isn't God just as capable of using us as he is Moses? Can't God do this through me as well as he can do it through him? The text puts it this way, if you read there in Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says this, it says, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they ask? Hasn't he also spoken through us? I love this next few words. It's highlighted. What does it say? What's the yellow say? And the Lord heard this. I love that. It's always an encouragement to read those final words and to know that God was listening to this whole thing. And the Lord heard this. What that tells me, 
And what I take great comfort in is the fact that God is watching out for his leaders. God is watching out for his leaders. He knows when someone's being a cantankerous old coot. Can you say those words in church? Well, I just did, so I guess you can. God knows that. He, he's watching that. He hears that. He knows when someone who's serving him as a leader is being cut down. And God will take action to protect those who are truly seeking to do his will. Let's take a moment to read some more of this chapter to put it all in context. It's quite insightful when you read down through it. We'll continue on there with verse number 3 and following. It says, Now Moses was a very humble man. Now get this, I love this. God's talking about this, so it's, it's pretty cool. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Here's a man leading approximately 2 million people, working the miracles of God in order to free them, teaching the people of God, walking with the people of God, directing the people of God, speaking with God. And God says of him, in spite of all that, Moses is more humble than anyone else on the earth. Wouldn't it be nice if God could say of us, he is truly, or she is truly, a humble servant of mine. Wouldn't that be wonderful? He goes on to say, At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud, and he stood at the entrance of the tent, and he summoned Aaron and Miriam. When both of them stepped forward, can you imagine this? Aaron, Miriam, step forward. Ah. <laughs> There's Moses still there. Can you just imagine? I mean, picture this. Picture what's going on. They step forward, and he said, who's he? God said, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I, re I reveal myself to him in visions, and I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face. Clearly, not in riddles, he sees the form of the Lord. It goes on to say, Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them. And he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, <laughs> look at that. What does that yellow say? There stood Miriam, leprous like snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had leprosy. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, do not hold up against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. In essence, oh, come on, brother. Don't let this happen. Uh, we're sorry. He goes on to say, Do not let her, meaning Miriam, do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Oh God, please, please heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days. And the people did not move on until she was brought back. After that, the people left Hazeroth and encamped in the desert of Paran. Friends, God sees it like it is. God sees it like it is. Moses is a humble man. Moses is a meek man. And God tells it like it is. This is my servant, Moses. In essence, you guys have picked on the wrong guy. This is my man. This is my leader. You guys have picked on the wrong guy because when you mess with my leader, when you mess with my man, you mess with me. Now it seems like Miriam must have been the ringleader of this rebellion. 
Now, there's a reason I say that. I think she's probably the ringleader because she's the one who got leprosy. In spite of her rebellion, Moses goes to bat for his sister Miriam, pleading for God to take mercy on her. That's leprosy, just so you have some idea what it looks like on the screen back there. This was not a pleasant thing for Miriam. This was a real eye-opener. God was serious about this. He did not want Miriam grumbling against and trying to bring down Moses because Moses was his man. Moses was his leader. Friends, it is a dangerous thing to grumble against those that God has placed in positions of leadership. This is especially true when they're doing their very best in the service of Almighty God. Now, there are times that leaders get out of whack, and we've got to deal with that. I understand that. But when they are doing their best to do the will of God, we need to be supportive of the men of God. Because God hears, God sees, and God has the power to protect his leaders. Now, you have to understand there's a big difference between grumbling and helping. Aaron and Miriam were grumbling, trying to cut Moses down, trying to get onto him for the sake of taking his position and bringing him down to their level. Remember there was a guy by the name of Jethro, his father-in-law. He came in and he said, now Moses, what you're doing is not good. You're going to wear yourself out trying to take care of all these people. You need to divide them up in groups and put people over those groups so you're not working yourself silly. And whenever you get them all divided up in groups, you let them decide the, the easy cases and let them bring the really, really hard ones to you so you're not trying to decide whose bubble gum that is. No, I didn't say that. You know what I mean? You're not trying to decide those little things that people are arguing about, but you're, you're saving your time for the big things. Now, he was trying, Jethro was trying to help Moses. He wasn't just trying to cut him down. Sometimes in order to help a leader, you've got to share where their shortfallings are in order that they can grow and develop into what God would have them to be. That's part of being a leader. You have to accept that kind of, that kind of uh, instruction, if you will. And his father-in-law gave it to him, and he divided him up, and I think it was a lot better for him afterwards. That's not grumbling, that's helping. Can you see the difference between someone grumbling to cut somebody down and someone that genuinely wants to help by sharing the truth with someone? You've got to recognize the difference. One should be accepted and even encouraged, and the other should be disdained and discouraged. And we've got to make sure we know the difference. Well, that brings us to our second point this morning. As we turn from the followers to the leaders themselves. Now, when you're Turning to the leaders themselves, there's some things that we need to learn too as leaders. Taking the glory of God upon oneself is a dangerous thing to do. Man, if you're running around shooting your own, look at me, look what I did. I have grown this church. I have made a difference. I have accomplished this. I have, and you fill in the blank. If you're a leader that's running around tooting his own horn, smacking people up the side of the head, letting them fall down, or they say, praise God, look what I did. They have missed the point altogether. It's not about you. It's not about your glory. It's all about the glory of God. Now, no one ever said Moses was perfect. Moses was doing his best, and therefore I believe it was God blessed. But here's the bottom line. This man, Moses, that is one of the most humble people, meek people on the earth, he had kind of a short fuse sometimes. And whenever people got to grumbling, sometimes it ruffled his feathers. It seems like these Israelites have been grumbling about everything under the sun. I mean, they were grumbling about not having water. They were grumbling about not having meat. They were grumbling about the water being bitter. They were grumbling because they longed to go back to Egypt. And here they were out in the desert. They even accused Moses and God of bringing them out of Egypt, away from their meat pots, into the desert, in order that they could die there. And that's how ornery these folks had become. And that leads us to Numbers chapter 20. If you're following along in the scriptures, Numbers chapter 20. Here in Numbers 20, Moses is once again listening to the grumbling and the bickering of the Israelites. They're just growling like crazy. He's watched again and again as God demonstrates his great power before them. And he is fed up with this bunch of grumblers. He's had enough of it. But they just don't get it. They don't get it. 
What they needed to understand and what Moses did understand is God can and God will provide. Now, I don't have time. I can tell you a whole bunch of ways that God's provided in our life. There's just not enough time to do it this morning. What I do want you to know is Moses has met with God. And God has told Moses just how he wants him to deal with this bunch of grumblers out here. We're thirsty. I want something to drink. Can I have a drink, Moses? I mean, that, that's where he was. We're thirsty. And God says to Moses, you go out there and you speak to that rock. And it'll bring forth enough water to give, give drinks to over two million people. That's some rock. That is some artesian spring. It's going gonna, it's gonna to flow out enough water to take care of all these grumbling people. Let's take a look at the story. In Numbers chapter 20, beginning with verse number 2. This is what it says. It says, Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and to Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into the desert that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain, no figs, no grapevines, no pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting, fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he has commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels. What does it say next? I just want to make sure you're with me. Must we bring you water out of the rock? Must we bring you water? out of the rock. Moses raised his arm and he struck the rock twice with his staff. Just in case you're sleeping, I thought we can. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I give them. These were the waters of Mirabah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he showed himself holy among them. What a story. What a beautiful picture of God's power and example that even good leaders can make mistakes. Take a good look there in verse 10. What Moses says, must we bring you water from the rock? Moses and Aaron are in essence stealing God's glory. Must we... Moses and Aaron, must we bring you water out of this rock? Stealing the glory of God. God said to talk to the rock, and the rock would spew out water. No, that's not what Moses did. He struck it two times with his, with his staff, with a stick, if you will. God didn't say smack the rock. God did not say pretend that you have the power to do this. God won't put up with someone stealing his glory. As a result of Moses' actions, both he and Aaron were restricted from entering the promised land. The fact is, taking the glory of God upon oneself is a very dangerous thing to do. And that brings us to our third and final point this morning. Sidestepping the direct command of God is a dangerous thing to do. Sidestepping the direct command of God is a dangerous thing to do. This takes us to the story of Balaam and Balak in Numbers 22, if you wonder where we're going next. Balak sees the nation of Israel on the doorstep of his kingdom. I mean, there's two million people traveling across the desert, and they are headed toward his land. Can you imagine how you would feel if there were two million Muslims over in Illinois heading this way, saying that they were going to conquer us and take over everything we have? How would you feel if you saw two million Muslims over there? I'm using that as an example because that's how Balak felt. He saw these Israelites come. This is a religious group. They're following Jehovah. They're following a God that's not his God. And they're heading in his direction. And Balak's ended up on the the hill there. He's calling for this guy by the name of Balaam to come and join him. He says, I'm scared to death. 
Not only was Balak un uncomfortable, not only was Balak scared, but his people were terrified as well. Can't you imagine how you would feel if two million people were marching toward at Newmarket right now and you knew that they had destroyed and conquered and wiped out all the people that they had fought against up to that point? I would think you and I both would be terrified. And so were these people. He had heard how Israel had wiped out the Amorites. He decided to call in a prophet and have the nation of Israel cursed by that prophet. So he called for Balaam and he made him quite a generous offer. If you will curse this people, I'll make you a rich man. Now you all remember the story of the talking donkey. You probably read that one and thought, Woohoo, that's a cool story. I won't even go into that. I think you read that one because it was just so much fun. So I'll skip over that one. What I'd like to point out this morning is how Balaam ultimately gave Balak exactly what he wanted. He gave him exactly what he wanted. God wouldn't let Balaam curse Israel. He said, oh, contraire. You're not going to curse them. Those are my people. You're not going to do it. But what Balaam knew was Israel had a weakness. Here's what Balaam said. He said, God won't let me curse them. But if you want to bring this group of Israelites down, here's what you need to do. You need to encourage the Baal worshipers to go down amongst them. They'll take care of it for you. How do I know that? Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse number 14. Here's what it says there in Revelation. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of, of Balaam, who taught Balak, the story we're talking about now, over in Revelation talking about, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrifice to idols, to the Baal, if you will, and by committing sexual immorality. You see, Baal was a god of fertility. Now, we don't like to talk about these things because they make us uncomfortable, but, but they're in there. It's like Prego. Baal was a god of fertility. Baal was worshipped through the act of offerings and through the act of sexual intercourse. Read it for yourself. That's how they were worshipping Baal. And as a result, they turned away from God because the young people of Israel would rather worship that way than the way they've been worshiping. The Israelites, they jumped right on board, so to speak. It was the old adage, if it feels good, let's do it. That's where they were. They began to eat the food sacrificed to idols. They began to worship the idols by having sexual intercourse with the temple prostitutes. And God's anger burned against them. It ticked God off that they were worshiping this false god in this way. God had those who had fallen under the spell of idolatry. He had them killed, and they were killing them one after another. And finally, this devastating purge that was taking place as they were all dying for their idolatry was put to an end when a man by the name of Phinehas came up to an Israelite tent with a spear. And inside of that tent, there was a prostitute and an Israelite worshiping through a sexual intercourse inside the tent. And he took his spear and ran them both through and straight into the ground and pinned them there with the spear. Finally, God said, okay, you've got the point. You're getting it. This is not appropriate. Later, Balaam himself will get his just desserts for his underhanded action against Israel through Balak and, and the forces of Baal. If you turn to Joshua 13.22, you'll see what happens to him. It says there, in addition to those slain in battle, the Israelites had put to the sword, get this, Balaam, son of Beor, who practiced divination. The same Balaam who had enticed the Israelites to sin. So what have we learned today? We've learned that grumbling about God's leader is a dangerous thing to do. We've learned that taking the glory of God upon oneself is a dangerous thing to do. We've learned that sidestepping the direct command of God is a dangerous thing to do. Friends, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. These things that were dangerous then are still dangerous today. What we want to do is seek to surpass the Israelites in our submission to Almighty God. Let's be the people God has called us to be. Let's follow Jesus. Let's serve him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, in a new way of the Spirit, rather than in the old way of the written code. Let's set aside our rebellion and become dedicated followers of Almighty God. When you have God living in you, 
I promise you, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. If you've not asked God to live in your heart, if you've not asked his spirit to fill you and lead you, there's no better time than now to make that commitment. As we stand and we sing our hymn of commitment this morning, greater is he that is in me. You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at Newmarket Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.